Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am really thrilled to welcome you to tonight's event with William Harris, presenting his new book, Zero to Birth, How the Human Brain is Built, joined in conversation tonight by Joshua Sains. Tonight's event is part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now everywhere else. Be on the lookout for more virtual science book talks coming up this summer, including with John Colapinto on May 19th for his book, This is the Voice, all about the human voice, how we speak and listen, exchange information, and the musicality behind it all. To learn more about the series, you can visit our webpage, harvard.com slash science, or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. And we also have a YouTube page for previous talks that you might have missed. Tonight's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A button on your screen where you can submit a question. We will get through as many as time allows for. And also a reminder that if you would like closed captions, you may click the live transcript tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'd also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thanks to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, for indie book selling and for science. And finally, as you know, with virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. And now I am pleased to introduce tonight's speakers to award-winning neuroscientists. Dr. William Harris has had an extensive career spanning two decades at University of California, San Diego, and another two decades at Cambridge University, where he was head of the Department of Physiology, Development, and Neuroscience. He's joined tonight by Harvard's own Dr. Joshua Sains, where he is professor of molecular and cellular biology and the founding director of the Center for Brain Science. Dr. Sain served on the planning committee as well for the incredible NIH Brain Initiative. This evening, they will be discussing Dr. Harris's new book, Zero to Birth, a chronicle of the human brain's unique and breathtaking development. NYU professor Mariah Thomason praises the book, quote, combining humor with state-of-the-art science, Harris tells the stories of the scientists who pushed the frontiers of our understanding and crafts a tale that leaves you smiling. We're so pleased to host them both tonight. So without further ado, uh, Bill and Josh, the digital podium is yours. Well, thank you very much. Um, so let me uh, introduce uh, to everybody uh, tonight's author, my old friend, Bill Harris. I'll tell you a little bit about him, uh, trying not to eat into his time. Um, Bill started his life in Toronto and then migrated steadily southward for a while. He went to college at UC Berkeley and then graduate school at Caltech, uh, where he worked with the uh, very well-known founder, really, of Drosophila neurobiology, Seymour Benzer. Uh, he then came eastward, and that's where I met him, in the Harvard Neurobiology Department, where he worked with Hubel and Weasel, uh, switching to vertebrates, uh, working on the visual system, beginning his uh, own career studying the visual system of lower vertebrates, salamanders, uh, xenopus, zebrafish. Um, he then uh, went back to San Diego as a faculty member, as you just heard, where he began um, a long and very productive 40-year uh, uh, professional and personal collaboration with Christine Holt. Um, over that time, uh, they shared a lab in which they uh, collaborated often, uh, but probably more often pursued their own uh, separate and complementary interests in the development of the visual system. Um, they also collaborated productively at home. Uh, they're the parents of uh, two wonderful children who are uh, carrying the Holt-Harris scientific tradition into another generation. Um, they moved uh, to Cambridge, England uh, for Bill and back to England for Christine in the early 2000s uh, and were there uh, continuing their highly successful work, again, 
some collaborative, mostly separate, uh, until uh, the very, very recent past. Um, Bill has been an author of a really wonderful textbook on developmental neurobiology that's gone through a few editions. And what he's done now is take his uh, knowledge of the field uh, from the book, from his own experience um, and his uh, excellence in presentation and put it together in this book, which uh, makes developmental neurobiology uh, live and exciting for a general audience. So let me turn it over to you, Bill, and um, tell us about the book, and then I'll come back for some discussion. Great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Very kind of you to say all that stuff. I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Can you see that as a slide? Yes. Yes, okay. So the book focuses on the key moments of brain development. It's a coming of age story for your brain, if you like. The chapters, they focus on concepts as they apply to the successive stages of brain development. I worked as a developmental neurobiologist throughout my career, trying to understand a little about how the most complex biological thing in the known world is built. So let's start right in with chapter one, called the rise of the neurons. This chapter is about how some of the cells of the early embryo become the founders, the atoms and eaves of our brains. And here we see Hans Spemann, who worked in Germany in the early 1900s and his famous transplant experiments. At a stage of development known as the blastula, which is basically a hollow ball of cells, a thousand cells, and he did this in newts, not in humans, of course, Spayman transplanted groups of cells from one place in one embryo to a different place in a host embryo. And he found that the transplanted cells of the donor incorporated themselves beautifully into the host, meaning that they were multipotent. They were capable of making muscle, bone, skin, guts, blood and brain, etc. And these multipotent cells are known as embryonic stem cells. But when he did the same experiment at a slightly later stage, just a few hours later, at the beginning of a stage called gastrulation, which happens at about three weeks in humans, he got a hugely surprising result. The embryo had grown a Siamese twin to which it was joined belly to belly. That is the host embryo had grown the twin. And this was incredible and totally unexpected. And it led to our current understanding of how some of the cells in the embryo become committed to make the nervous system. This is Hilde Mangold a graduate student of Spayman, who transplanted the same groups of cells as Spayman had at the gastrula stage, but this time she used two different species of newts as donors and hosts. She used a light colored species as a donor and a dark colored species as a host. And this allowed her to determine the cellular composition of the extra twin. And she found that almost all the cells of the extra twin including the brain. So here's the normal animal here, a cross section of the normal animal. And here's the normal neural tube or beginning of the nervous system. And here's the extra embryo over here. And here's the host, that mean the, yeah, the, 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 the extra neural tube and it's dark. So it's of host origin. The donor cells were mostly these light ones here in an ancient vertebrate structure known as the notochord. And these cells are able to organize the other cells around it to make structures like the nervous system. It took nearly 70 years to get the first insights into how the cells of this region, now known as the organizer, influence the surrounding cells to do things like become the nervous system. It was in 1992 that Richard Harland and his colleagues at Berkeley found a protein that they called noggin, 
that the organizer releases and it causes these multipotent embryonic stem cells to become committed neural stem cells. And thanks to many such recent advances in the field, one can now take cells from a human being, expose them to factors that reprogram them to become like multipotent embryonic stem cells, and then expose those cells to factors like noggin, so they become committed neural stem cells. And if such cells are grown in the right way, they build tiny neural structures like these little guys here in the Petri dish. And we call them mini brains or brain organoids. And it's all in a Petri dish. Now we can grow human brain organoids and use them for research into human brains. And they have tremendous medical potential for understanding diseases and neural repair. Chapter two is called bow plan of the brain because it's about how the brain builds itself from these neural stem cells, which are dividing at this point. One of the things highlighted at this chapter is that growing brains look remarkably similar in different species of vertebrates. Here's a newt and here's a human. And the forebrain is in yellow and green. The midbrain is in blue and the hindbrain is in, in uh, pink and orange, and that spinal cord is in lime green in both animals. You can see that it's organized the same way. And this suggests a deep evolution of this organization back to the first vertebrates some 600 or so million years ago, which are thought to resemble lampreys, the extant, extant animal lampreys, whose brains are organized in pretty much the same way as ours. And it's patterned by fabulous molecular mechanisms that are discussed in chapter two of the book. Now, while the brain is being divided and subdivided into its many regions, it is also growing at a tremendous rate. Chapter three is called proliferation, and it talks about how the growing population of neural stem cells produces a brain of the right size and proportions. For example, a uh, young neural stem cell, the ancestral cells of the uh, ancestral cell of a brain, is dividing, uh, proliferating at first. So one neural stem cell makes two neural stem cells. Two neural stem cells make four. Four make eight. The growth is exponential, as you can see in the first trimester. And it's estimated that near the end of the first trimester of pregnancy, the fetal human brain is making more than 15 or 20 million cells per hour. Um, during the second trimester, growth becomes more linear. And that's because um, when a neural stem cell divides, it sometimes makes two different daughters, only one of which continues as a neural stem cell. And the other becomes a neuron, which never divides again. Now, by the third trimester, neural stem cells stop making any more neural stem cells, and they make two daughters, both of which are neurons that never divide again. And so the growing brain runs out of neural stem cells, and new neuron production grinds to a halt by the time of birth. Another story in this chapter is that it's been known for centuries that human brains don't seem to regenerate much after injury but do we really have no neural stem cells in our adult brains? Many vertebrates do. Fish do, amphibians do, reptiles do. Jonas Friesen, working at the Karolinska Institute, discovered a way for looking for new neurons in adult human brains based on carbon-14 that was released into the atmosphere by atomic bomb testing during the Cold War. Between 1953 and 1963, until the nuclear partial nuclear test ban treaty was signed. And then you could see that the C-14 in the atmosphere declined as it was taken up into uh, various uh, gr growth. And we can trace the extra C-14 in tree rings. For example, this tree ring laid down in 1950 has no higher than background level of C14, but tree ring from 
1985 has a substantial amount. Similarly, Friesen's analysis of human brains gathered at autopsy showed that the neurons of the cerebral cortex, like a tree ring in the body, is laid down at birth. So if you were born before 1953, there would be no extra C14 in the DNA of the neurons of your cerebral cortex. Whereas if you were born 10 years later, near the peak of C14 in the atmosphere, this is the level of C14 in the DNA of all your cortical neurons, indicating that no new cortical neurons are born after birth. There is still a little debate in the field about whether adult humans uh, add new neurons to a structure in the brain called the hippocampus involved in storing new memories. But the point I wanted to convey in chapter three is that your brain is populated at birth with the neurons that will last a lifetime. And now we meet Santiago Ramon y Cajal, known to many as the father of modern neuroscience. Cajal is famous because of his stunningly accurate and beautiful portraits of neuro individual neurons shown in galleries throughout the world and by his incredibly incredible scientific work where many of these pictures were first published. Written in 1909, Histology of the Nervous System of Man and Vertebrates, written originally in French, is still heavily used by neuroscientists today because so many of Cajal's observations and detailed drawings of different types of neurons are unsurpassed and hugely scientifically useful. These here are all different types of retinal ganglion cell Cajal drew with dendrites. These are the processes that collect information in, in different layers of the retina. And there are many different types of neurons in our brain. No one really knows how many because neuroscientists like Josh are still trying to figure out how to categorize them. Josh has identified, I think, about 30 different subtypes of retinal ganglion cell in the mouse. And here's one type that was found in Josh's lab that blew me away. We're looking at the retina on FAS, not a cross section as the previous slide was. Um, and it's interesting that these cells are sensitive to downward motion in the visual field. And this asymmetric anatomy they have where they don't have their dendrites all around, but just in one area, is not the result of visual experience. It's amazing and mysterious how any individual neuron type gains its distinctive morphology. And it's still an area we know fairly little about. We do know a little bit more about how cells get their individual fates this is a graphical metaphor from a of a developmental landscape created by Conrad Waddington, a British developmental biology theorist of the mid 20th century. It's a simple graphic of a downward sloping valley with elongated hills that divide the valley into glens. And down this valley rolls a ball representing, for example, a developing cell. And when the ball encounters the first hill, it, if it goes left, like here, it reduces its ability to choose other fates, such as those on the right over here. And as the ball continues its tra travel going left or right at each hill, it becomes more and more limited. Waddington imagined that influencers would push the balls and pull the balls this way or that way, so they made the right decision. But it seems that the neural stem cells in our brains are a bit unpredictable in many ways. They sometimes go down this pathway, they sometimes go down that one. This is to some extent like balls falling through a Galton maze. In this case, it's about 50-50, whether the ball chooses to go right or left at each pin. And yet, although we are unable to predict where any single ball ends up in such a situation, um, it creates a nice binomial shaped distribution of balls every time. Similarly, if we roll thousands of balls down Waddington's Valley, 
if chance is involved, we can still be confident of the general shape of the distribution of balls, or in the case of cells, that approximately the right proportions of each cell type will be generated. There are many other aspects of fate choice discussed in chapter four, by the end of which what is hopefully learned that the specific, ident the specific identity of every neuron in the brain stems from many things. It's evolutionary nature, like whether it's a human uh, neural stem cell, it's individual genome, it's position in the brain, it's lineage, who its parents and grandparents were, i.e. the neural stem cells that were its parents or grandparents, and the time and order of its birth, and the environmental factors that it and its ancestors got exposed to, and to Lady Luck too. It sounds like the making of a coming of age novel, no? This brings us to chapter five called Wiring Up. When a neuron is first born, it's useless as a processor of information, but when it settles into its permanent position in the brain, it sprouts branches that become dendrites. These are the dendrites of a Purkinje cell drawn by a human Purkinje cell drawn by Ramoni Cajal. And this is the axon coming out here. And it grows an axon to send out information. Chapter five focuses on the remarkable navigational feats of axons, the thin fibers that neurons send out that connect neurons in different regions of the brain together into a functional network. So let's watch. These are the axons of two retinal ganglion cells in the brain of an embryonic frog, and they're heading to their targets in the midbrain. I'm gonna stop it here. And they're paying out the axon behind. Note the enlargements at the tips of these uh, growing axons. These are called growth codes. Cajal had named them. Never seen them in action. And when they reach the target, they slow down and begin to branch. Oops. And we can break growing axons down into two classes. There's the pioneers, like these ones shown on the left here like this one shown on the left, and the followers like these ones on the right. The pioneers are guided by attractive and repulsive cues that pattern the brain and are in their environment. And the followers glom on to the early pioneers uh, by selective cellular adhesion. Over the course of my career, we have learned how growth cones use guidance cues and selective adhesion molecules many of which have been recently discovered to make their remarkable journeys from one part of the brain to the other. And this is what's covered in chapter five of the book. So how do they do it? I'll give you a feel for it uh, by introducing you to my new grandson, Adam here, whom I've morphed into a growing neuron of human proportions. Adam, the neuron, is sending on an axon tipped with a growth cone here, which is finding its way to Somerset. The distance uh, many axons might have to travel if they were the size of a human. The map is supposed to be fuzzy, so don't worry. It's only meant to remind you that the young brain is patterned into many regions and subregions, which have molecular identities. And these pioneering growth cones use the regional differences as guidance cues like you or I might read a map to interpret where you are now and where you need to go next. And this molecular map of the young brain is being used by different axons traveling in different directions to other places in the brain. Like different people may all consult the same map to navigate to different places. Investigating axon growth and guidance during development is helping us search for ways to treat neural injuries, such as spinal cord lesions. Research has revealed that adult mammalian neurons are intrinsically less able to regrow than our young neurons. 
they appear to have lost some of the mojo of their youth. Research also indicates that the site that bears the scar of the neural damage is full of material that inhibits the growth of axons. And another huge challenge is the fact that the guidance cues that were used by axons to find their targets during their initial outgrowth in the embryo may no longer be available to guide regrowing axons in the adult, and the distances are much greater. So while there has been considerable progress in understanding the underlying challenges for regeneration, there has only been limited success in full recovery of spinal cord damage, although progress is being made. Next, from chapter six, we consider the moment in the lives of two neurons when an axon of the first, having arrived at the target region, meets a dendrite of the second. So here's the axon and its terminal, and here's the dendrite of the second. The two recognize that they are meant for each other, and they stick tightly together, and they seal the deal by making a synapse. And this is an electron micrograph of a synapse uh, blown up tens of thousands of times. Um, and these are, these are the little vesicles in the presynaptic element that are full of neurotransmitter. But it's like finding your perfect part, partner. And this is the next level of precision after you've navigated correctly to your target. And one of the most amazing stories in chapter six comes from the work of Roger Sperry, whom I was lucky enough to be a teaching assistant for when I was a grad student at Caltech. In one key experiment, Sperry loosened the eyeball of a frog in its socket. He then cut the optic nerve, rotated the eye 180 degrees, and sewed it back in upside down. So this is the upside down eye. The question he was asking with this experiment was whether the regrowing nerves would find their old synaptic partners, for if so, vision would be rotated for the animal? And the answer was yes. When vision returned, the frogs behaved as if their world was back to front and upside down through the rotated eye. The axons had grown back to their old places in the midbrain, even though this was clearly maladaptive. Moreover, the operated animals never learned to snap in the correct direction. So Sperry imagined that every neuron in the retina was chemically marked with its coordinates, its X and Y coordinates, if you like, as was every neuron in the target area of the midbrain, ensuring beautiful topographic mapping. He called this chemo affinity. Many molecules, including the ones that Sperry might well have envisaged, have been discovered. Indeed, the modern view is that most neurons seem to know with whom they wish to make synapses. Axons of some cells show an affinity for, a chemo affinity, if you like, the dendrites of others. And this hardwiring of synaptic connect connectivity is done according to biochemical rules of matchmaking involving gradients and cross gradients of attractants and repellents, a huge variety of adhesion molecules and signatures of cell identity. And this allows for a good deal of precision wiring. Once synapses are made, neurons can finally begin to talk to each other in the electrical language of the brain, voltage pulses traveling along axons and dendrites, and synapses firing, neurons influencing each other's activity patterns. And this starts a new period of brain development discussed in chapter seven called making the cut. Making functional synapses is a life or death matter for billions of your neurons. The overall chances of survival for a young neuron in your brain is only about 50%. So why build a brain this way? Why not make the right number of neurons? Well, you might think of it as how a coach might build a team from those who try out for different positions. Only the best make the team. But of course, there's no coach involved in the selection process. Neurons select themselves for the brain team. Like the branches and roots of plants battle each other for access to sunlight and soil, the axons and dendrites of neurons 
fight with each other to make and receive synaptic connections. And those neurons that don't make enough synaptic connections commit suicide by a process of self-digestion called apoptosis. And here you're looking at Victor Hamburger, one of the heroes of chapter seven. Victor was a graduate student of Hans Spemann and a mentor of Josh Sains. And he was doing his postdoctoral studies in Chicago when the Nazis came to power. Being a Jew, he stayed in the USA and ended up at Washington University in St. Louis. And here is Rita Levi Montalcini, another hero of chapter seven. Levi Montalcini was forced out of her job at the University of Turin in Italy and went into hiding with her Jewish family. And it was there she read Hamburger's papers. And while in hiding, she set up a laboratory in her room with the most basic equipment where she repeated Hamburger's experiments. These experiments involved removing the limb bud of a chick embryo just a few days after it was laid. And here's a needle coming in to remove this hind limb bud from this chick embryo. And a week or so later, you look at a section of the spinal cord and you look at the motor neurons on the side uh, with the missing leg and the side with the normal leg. Motor neurons are the neurons in the spinal cord that innervate the muscles of the limb. And the finding was that there were fewer motor neurons on the side with the missing limb. Levi Montalcini looked at the spinal cords of the embryos on successive days following the removal of the limb. And she saw that most of the neurons had already been generated on both sides, but then the motor neurons on the side without the limb began to die. Indeed, we know now that neurons need to make effective synaptic, effective synaptic connections to survive because survival factors are transferred between cells. After the war, Hamburger invited Levi Montalcini to his lab and they worked closely together for many years. Their most remarkable finding was that even in normal development, the spinal cord makes almost twice as many motor neurons as survive. Look at the blue line there in this graph. The same is true with a frog or a chick or a mouse or a human. It's not just muscles and motor neurons though, every part of the brain needs to be well matched. For example, the right balance of excitatory to inhibitory neurons in the brain depends on the death, excuse me, of overproduced inhibitory neurons. It's based on feedback mechanisms involving synaptic communication. Now, a young neuron has made enough connections to survive. It has made the cut. It has established synapses along its branches and dendrites roots. It now has a good chance of surviving for a lifetime. But this brings up the period of refinement, chapter eight. When the war for survival winds down in a young brain, one finds that the young survivors have usually made extensive connections. It's a period of exuberant connectivity. But like plants, young neurons get pruned. Again, this is largely done on the basis of electrical communication, whether the synapses are strengthened and survive or outcompeted and pruned away. And this is refinement has going on, has been going on before birth in many periods, many parts of the brain, but it continues into childhood in, in the cerebral cortex. And one of the most famous experiments on synaptic pruning in the brain was done by my supervisors, David Hubel and Torsten Weasel at Harvard Medical School, which is where I met uh, Josh. And they raised cats with a patch over one eye. And they found that if the patch was removed any time after three months, vision through the deprived eye was lost in the visual cortex throughout life because synapses serving it had been pruned away while the synapses from the non-deprived eye had taken over. This is demonstrated dramatically in these images from the visual cortex. The synaptic territory of the right eye is in dark and the left eye is in light. And in a normal animal, they compete rather equally and 
have an equal amount of synaptic territory in the cortex. But when the right eye is deprived of vision, so it has no role in driving the postsynaptic cells in the visual cortex, the other eye, the left eye, takes over. The critical period for binocular vision in the cat is over by three months. It takes longer in humans, several years, but the earlier one corrects conditions like lazy eye, the better. Language is another example of something that happens through a critical period, and there are many. It's easy to learn a language when you're a kid, not very easy to learn a language when you're an adult, generally. But as the neuron adjusts its synapses and is pruned through this period of maximum plasticity, it becomes more and more shaped to its recognizable form of an adult neuron in the brain, one that Cajal might have done a portrait of like this reconstructed adult neuron in a mouse brain showing where all the synapses are. I think this came from Jeff Lickman's lab. This neuron with its thousands of well-tuned, refined connection stays for life. It embodies some of the live wires of the functioning adult brain. Although it's always changing a bit, just like its owner. Here is a bit of a dendrite in the visual cortex of an adult mouse and you can see the spines changing over the course of days. The continued ability of spines to change and their to change their efficacy accounts for our continued ability to learn. It helps us maintain a good mental relationship with our particular world outside the womb, which is continually changing. And this should be the end of the story, but I decided to write one additional chapter, chapter nine, becoming human and becoming you. This final chapter is like an epilogue and it talks about what's special about the human brain. Things like the size of the cerebral cortex, which is, becomes the dominant neural structure in humans. The number of regions of the cerebral cortex, the variability in the sizes of these regions, the considerable asymmetry of human brains and describes what, no, what we know, actually what little we know, about how the principles described in chapters one through eight are orchestrated to make human brains that are human and different to those of animals and our closest hominid ancestors. And how the mechanisms that are involved in building a brain ensure that everybody, even identical twins raised in identical environments, is born with a unique brain, which is different to everyone else's. So I will stop here and thank you all for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss with Josh and members of the audience. Great, fantastic summary. Um, obviously a topic close to my heart and I have, uh, I could go on for hours with questions about every single chapter, but I won't. Um, let me start the discussion, and encourage uh, people in the audience to put their questions into the Q&A. Um, and then I may look at a few and Kate will look at more. So let, let me start with um, a topic that's especially close to my heart. In the chapters on axons and synapses, you talk a lot about the specificity of the connections that uh, neurons make with each other. And of course, that specificity is required to make the circuits that underlie uh, everything we think or decide or move or do or whatever. Um, but I guess my question is, do you think some of us, and by us I include myself, sort of overdo it. Um, in, in other words, how specific do the connections really have to be to give us a superbly functioning brain? I, I, I think about engineering in, in which there's this idea that uh, circuits or machines have to be robust to some amount of error, either by having duplicative mechanisms or fail-safe mechanisms or whatever. And so that's the general question. Can we, can we get away with less than perfection and yet function at a very high level? Yeah, I guess we have to get away with less than perfection. But if you look up, um, you know, if you want to do engineering, you, you get attracted by precision engineering. And I would think that the brain is a hugely precise thing and it's constructed in a hugely precise way as precise as it possibly can be, but it's still not precise enough to hit a baseball like Joe DiMaggio did or you know, play hockey like Austin Matthews does. Um, 
it still needs a lot of refinement and fine tuning to do that. And it's built with that uh, amount of flexibility in it. So while axons are trying to find just the right partner, they found just the right partner and a few others around them generally that are pretty good matches. And maybe the, some of those become more important than others as things get tuned. How yeah. does that sound? No, I think it sounds good. I guess I would still argue that, you know, maybe the reason uh, Joe DiMaggio only hit 300, he was doing great, but it's because there were still some mistakes left. He, he had a wonderful uh, motor system, but an imperfect one, yet he was able to do just fine. Yeah. Um, now, and, the and question, the things... now the question is, you know, did, did the nervous system try to m make sure that there was mistakes or did it try to do the best that it could so there wasn't any but there was still some left over and i'm yeah. kind of more in i'm more in the latter camp yeah it makes sense and certainly we have a great ability to compensate i think you talk about that in the book you know people who have let's say amyotrophic lateral sclerosis can lose many motor neurons before they know that anything's wrong or people with glaucoma can lose many retinal neurons before they know something's wrong and so there's this other factor that at least for humans uh, we're resilient enough to uh, fool ourselves, frankly, and, and compensate for defects. So that's, that's sort of another aspect of it. Sure. And some people are born without a corpus callosum that connects the right hemisphere to the left hemisphere, and they don't know it themselves, and most people don't know it. Some people are born without a cerebellum, which is you know hugely important for most of us. And maybe they use their cerebral cortex to make sure that they're doing the right movements. And if you, if you have a neural injury when you're a kid, you compensate better than when you're an adult. And that's, I think, because of the, A, the lack of regeneration, and B, the fact that your neurons have gone through this, through these critical periods and are not so plastic anymore themselves. Yeah. So w while we're talking about those sort of changes, let me read you a question uh, from the Q&A. Um, which is related, which is uh, here, here we get to adulthood uh, in chapter nine. And then uh, as many of us in our age range know, things begin to go downhill. And can you say something about what are the brain changes that occur with aging? Not a whole lot. I'm, I'm a developmental biologist and I'm not uh, uh, someone who works in that field, but I know that there are a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. And I know that just a normal, healthy brain um, changes. Just like we change on the outside, um, our neurons are probably changing too, getting a little weaker, you know, a little less flexible. Um, they're, they're building up damage. You know, it's not in their knees, but it's in their synapses in their branches and things yeah. like that. So I think that kind of stuff is going on with neurons, particularly because they have to live this whole lifetime. They're one of, the, one of the cells in your body that never gets replaced. So they accumulate aging. Yeah. So let me turn to another topic um, that you already touched on in your talk. Um, and, and so I, I guess to get started, you talk a lot about the fact that our brains are shaped by nature, the hardwiring and nurture, the rearrangements. And of course, there's a lot of nurture going on even uh, in utero. Um, but you also talk in several places about the idea that there's a role for chance. Uh, it comes up in the description you gave about uh, cell type specification. It comes up in cortical patterning, dendritic patterning. Um, and of course, it's very hard to prove that something's random uh, to distinguish that from uh, experimental imprecision. Um, but if you're a believer, and I certainly am, um, then we have to ask how much of a role is there for stochasticity? Does it, does it all average out, as you say? If you flip a coin once, you don't know what the outcome will be. If you flip a coin a thousand times, you pretty much know what the outcome will be. Um, or is there enough stochasticity that could actually account for some of the individual differences in human behavior that we see? Let's say even between identical twins. Uh, I, I would think so, yes. 
a, a good example is the red and green cones in our eyes. You can have a red cone that sees red light well, or a green cone that sees green light well. That's two genes that are next to each other. And um, one can fire and the other not fire in a cell. And it seems to be done randomly. Some people have more red cones than green cones. Some people have more green than red. Most of us have about 50-50. But the people that have more red than green see a slightly different world than the people that have more green than red. So that's just one example of a, a, a random thing, what seems like a fairly random thing that's happening. But genes are switching on and off in a stochastic way. And while it's true that if you build a coin flipper and put it in an isolated room, you can get it to flip ahead every time. Um, in the real world, where there's so many things going on, you can't really calculate whether it's going to be a head or a tail. And so we use the mathematics of chance, even though, as you say, if we were smart enough, we could figure out all the things that were influencing any particular decision. That may be true, but it's just too difficult. And the mathematics of chance seem to parallel well what nurse, um, neural stem cells are doing in terms of the types of neurons they make. Sometimes they may make two ganglion cells, sometimes they may make one. But overall, it comes out to more or less the right number. Yeah, now that's good. So we're, we're running short in time. Let, let me ask another question that I think I can meld with a few coming up in the, in the chat. Um, and that, that has to do with some of the translational uh, relevance, the disease relevance of development. I mean, I think a lot of people, probably including you and me, uh, study neural development because it's just so damn fascinating and we want to know how it works. Um, but there are a lot of people who study it because they think it'll give deep insights that can be used to study not only developmental disorders, uh, where it's sort of obvious, um, but also uh, disorders of adulthood. Um, so, for example, you talked a little bit about apoptosis, um, in which, as you point out, cells commit suicide uh, rather than just sort of falling apart. And mm -hmm. once people uh, understood that apoptosis was a complicated active program, they began to think, well, maybe we can prevent neurons from dying uh, by interfering with that process. And maybe give them a little window of opportunity to uh, cure themselves or to survive the immediate insult. Um, another one would be, you talked a little bit about the critical period. People uh, sort of talk about using what we've learned about how the critical period is controlled to see if we can reopen it. For example, if people didn't have lazy eye corrected early on, can we go back later on and correct it? Um, can we ultimately help people learn a new language, even when they're uh, an adult? And, um, you know, I'm not sure there's a real question here, but I, I just give you the opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about what you think might be some of the promising avenues uh, through which development can uh, help us uh, treat brain dysfunction. Yeah. Well, um, there are many examples in the book, as you say, one of the first things I'd say is that of our, I don't know, approximately 20,000 genes, probably half of them are used in building the brain. And as we study more and more about developmental neurobiology, we find that there are diseases that are related to some of these genes that have popped up because we're studying brain development. And that gives insight into the mechanism of the disease and potential cure. But things like anti-apoptosis factors that help cells stay alive, that's still a really active area of research. And people would love to be able to slow down cell death in neurodegenerative diseases of the aged, for example. Uh, neuronal survival factors that work in, in, in the young ages too may also have an effects. But it's, you know, we have to get them to the right populations of neurons and save the right cells and not the wrong cells and find a way to deliver these medications. And that's still a challenging aspect. So yeah. there are things like that. 
Yeah, no, I think I agree. I think there's so many promising avenues uh, for, let's say, from Alzheimer's to autism. Um, as they but say, this is a very brains, good, Yeah, Fixing broken brains is one of the hardest th challenges yeah. of medicine, I think. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with, and I'll ask one more question and then uh, turn it over to Kate to go uh, straight to the chat. Um, there are so many differences between mice and humans and in the clinical realm uh, that manifests itself in the fact that this is a very good time to be a mouse with autism or alzheimer's because we can cure you <laughs> but the things that don't work in mice uh that do work in mice just don't seem to work in humans and nobody knows why as you point out there's just a matter of size there's a matter of that mice live two years and humans live 80 years um but i think a lot of it may have to do with the fact that there are deep fundamental differences that we try not to admit to ourselves between a mouse brain and a human brain. And, okay. and so I'll finish asking you about that. And that's what you cover in chapter nine. You talk about the difference in size, which is obvious, but a little bit about this idea of neoteny, that humans have this prolonged postnatal period when we are susceptible to uh, experience dependent refinement. And, and to some extent, that's what makes us so smart um, because we have more time to let the world sculpt our brains so that each of our brains fits uh, our body and our world. Um, do you, what do you think? What do about, I think about neoteny? Yeah. Yeah, I think humans definitely have uh, a, a neotenous kind of development. That means they come out with uh, parts of them that are immature. Our brain is relatively immature. It's thought that, you know, human, human brains got, as they got bigger and bigger and the skull is forming around them, became harder and harder for mothers to deliver babies that were fully mature in terms of their brain. And uh, their bodies are also not very mature when, when uh, humans are born. And they have to spend a lot of developmental time outside the womb. This is the, although all their neurons are born and many of them have already died, there's cell death that's going on postnatally in the brain and a lot of synaptic pruning that's going on, that's going on postnatally in the brain. Yeah, I is mean, that that's sort of a, no, no, I, I mean, that's sort of a, if you're Delta lemon, make lemonade explanation. I, I, I would say that we probably were selected for neoteny because it's been a great evolutionary advantage uh, rather than it being a workaround for a constricted uh, hip construction. Um, yeah. Let, let me, I mean, lots of, yeah, you know, let's go to the questions. Fine. Yeah. Kate, why don't you uh, take it away? Sounds great. Um, you guys are the experts. So if I ask something that's like a little bit overlapping, just, just give me a heads up. But um, I see we have two attendees who ask almost a really similar question about do scientists um, growing mini brains consider their ethical considerations? I'm seeing a lot of that here in the Q&A. Yeah, it's a really fascinating question. Uh, I gave my undergraduates here at Cambridge that question and they came up with some Good answers. Um, it, it's it's uh, one imagines that these little mini brains are active, and their neurons are firing, and they're processing something. But uh, most of them we don't give any inputs into, so we don't know what they're processing. And you know, if they're just a little part of the retina or a little part of the cortex, you know that they're they're human and they're doing something. Um, neural networky, but people haven't thought that they're you know, suffering or any of that stuff yet. And so people are still working on these things um, without too much concern that they're causing pain. But the other consideration is to understand about human brains, you have to study human brains and that's not easy. So human brains, you can't just go in there and say, okay, can I study your brain for a while and look at the cells? So these little um, mini brains or brain organoids are a way to study a disease, for example, outside the body in a way that's 
you know, could, could advance medical science quickly without hurting anyone. Yeah, maybe I can jump in here for a second. I had the privilege to be on a committee that was sort of looking at organoids and particularly the ethical issues. And one part of our report was a completely uh, unsuccessful rant about uh, the misuse of the term mini brain. They're really not mini brains. They're <laughs> collections of neurons um, that are better than the old fashioned neuronal cultures, which were grown flat in a Petri dish. Um, but they're not organized uh, terribly well. They don't really uh, look like any particular part of the brain. They certainly don't include multiple parts of the brain in any kind of order. And even the individual neurons never mature past a probably a late fetal stage. So uh, it's something that we have to think about because science moves fast and who knows what will happen. Yeah. But at I mean, the part moment, of the reason that Part of the reason that they don't grow is they don't have a blood supply. Yeah. And so and people are working blood on supply, the blood supply. And you can make a great big mini brain, a yeah. great big one, then what would you think? Yeah. No, I mean, I think we have to keep our eyes and ears and ethical antennae open to this. I'm not dismissing it, but I'd say in the foreseeable future, these are not mini brains that are thinking thoughts and feeling pain and having consciousness. And as they get more powerful, which they will, no doubt about it, people are trying to get them blood supplies. That's gonna make a big difference. People are trying to put in non-neuronal cells and that's gonna make a big difference. Um, but as they get more powerful, we're gonna to have to balance that against what Bill also said, which is there's a moral imperative to try to cure brain diseases, which are uh, epidemic, growing ever more epidemic, probably the source of you know, more suffering than any other class of diseases. So it, it, it is a difficult issue. Um, thank you for that. It looks like we have time for about one more question, maybe two. Um, so we have a great question here that says, are there any implications of this brain development process for the development of artificial intelligence? For example, things that AI can do, could in theory do, or cannot do at all. Yeah, I... Maybe Josh knows more about this than I do, but I'm hoping so. I'm hoping that the principles that we're learning about how brains develop and set up their circuits so that they work relatively well and can be tuned, and there are lots of principles we talk about in the book, could possibly be used in building machines. And that might give a way to build better intelligence machines, better, better computation. What do you think, Josh? No, I think there's, there's a really exciting two-way interaction between neuroscience and AI, you know, where uh, the results of machine learning are being used to tell us more about the brain and sure. uh, neuroscience, including developmental neuroscience, is being used to improve AI algorithms. Um, you know, machine learning is in large part based on what people know about neural networks. Right. Early days. How to build those neural networks. They haven't really got that going yet. They they start with a built neural network, but they as we learn more about how to build a brain, they could build their neural networks that way, yeah, maybe. Absolutely. All right. I think that is the end of our time, but thank you both so much for being here tonight. I don't know if you have anything that you want to close on before I wrap things up. Just thank you very much all for your attention. Thank you for hosting me and Josh. Thank you, Josh, for being a friend and uh, discussion. It's been a person. pleasure. And all I have to say is go buy Bill's book right away. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Links are in the chat. Well, thank you both for this fascinating presentation and discussion with such powerful implications for medical, ethical, technological implications for the future. I really loved it. Um, and thank you everyone out there for joining us this evening. If you would like to learn more about this topic, copies of Zero to Birth are for sale on harvard.com via the links I provided in the chat. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great evening, keep reading and please be well. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.